Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is joint work with Yoav Columbus, who is a PhD student of mine. Uh, Yoav would have given the talk, but uh, since he gave a talk last uh, year in the seminar, the organizers asked uh, to diversify and let, let me talk about, give the talk, so here I am. Uh, okay, so we all know that uh, lots of companies uh, keep on making their money from ad auctions. Every time there is some new pair of eyes to be sold to advertisers, they hold an auction, uh, various types of auctions between all the different advertisers about who gets to, 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 to win this pair of eyes, if you wish, this impression. And it's not, you know, Facebook does that, Google does it, many other people does it, do it, and many other companies do it. In general, it's very standard to have a very long sequence of auctions, sometimes for very low stakes. Uh, so it seems we understand these types of auctions and how to participate in them. But the truth is that because this is such a long list of auctions, uh, there are always practically no advertiser actually uh, actually bids in an auction directly, but rather they have some kind, if you wish, a software agent or an auto bidding agent where each one of the participants in the auction uh, enters some key parameters into some kind of software, face, some, some kind of software, some kind of advertiser facing interface and, and enters these parameters. And then the software, the agent is basically participates in a very long sequence of auctions in, on behalf of the advertiser uh, presumably optimizing for the advertiser. And if let's say the interface at Facebook, this is like the interface that Facebook gives to advertisers. And if Facebook is not optimizing well enough for the advertisers, it one could hope that some other company would write a better agent for the advertisers that uses goes directly to the Facebook API and participate in the auction in a better way, better for the advertiser. So this is what we want to study here. And here's the simplest kind of model that we have. Uh, so we have two players, of course, in general, it's like N players. Uh, each one of them is going to participate. They're going to participate in a very long list of auctions, but not directly. So each one of them has some kind of uh, interface, an agent, where our bidder basically has, the simplest model is each bidder has a value for an item enters this value once and for all into his user interface, into his agent. And then the two agents, each one of them got a number, participate in a very long sequence of auctions, uh, let's say for T sequential auctions. And again, we're looking at the simplest kind of model. So we're selling identical items. The utility of each bidder is uh, the value for each item is independent of the others. It's additive over the many uh, items that it wins. And, and that's all that we're going to do. Okay, no budgets, no, no nothing, no complications. We just participate in a very long sequence of auctions and want to make sure that in the long term we make as much value utility as possible. Okay, so so they are not identical, they're independent. They're it's identical. Not the same. It's not the same. It's not, no, it's not the same. It's a different item in each, in each time period, uh, but they're identical in the sense that they are worth the same for each one of the bidders. So no, so no, so that's a real question here. The value of all the items is chosen once and for all, and yes. that applies to all capital T items, or each time there is a new draw Indeed. of a value. No, for, no, for each, each time the simplest model, the same value every time. We don't have like a you could think of let's say a one ah. distribution or something like that. And if you wish, there is a distribution, but they only know the expected value to begin with. So it's like a single I value, but it's just okay. one. Number. Okay. So the independence is between the bidders when you said independent, okay. The independence is, no, the independence is that my value for the third item is independent of my value for the second item. It's always the same number, T. So oh, it's, okay, it's totally dependent. It's the same number and it does, so if I made $3 from, if the first item was equal $3 for me, the second item will also equal $3 for me, whether or not I won the first item. So there is no distribution here. Right? No, no distribution. distribution. If you really want to think about distribution, you can think it's the same distribution. I don't want to say. think about distribution. Okay, so don't think about distribution. Okay, good. Good. So the way we're going to look at it, we really have what's, if you wish, a meta auction. So now we're looking at, uh, so while the agents are participating in auctions, which is a very simple game, the uh, users, and we're going to worry about the users, are 
participating if you wish a meta kind of auction, a single meta auction, they enter their number, each one of them enters a number into an agent. And then the agents run this very long list of auctions and they get some kind of utility. They win X number of items and pay Y and that's it. So we have a meta auction here and we're going to study the meta auction that is basically induced by different types of auction, basic auction rules and by different types of natural uh, software agents, regret minimizing agents. And uh, just uh, I want to say that of course, you can talk about uh, this kind of concept of a, meta, uh, of a meta auction, you can apply it to general games. So we don't only need to think about the agents playing a auction between, between each other, but they can participate in any game. And then you gain basically a general meta game. And you can also study games and we do that in a different paper, but I'll focus on auctions here. Okay, now, the, so agent, the agents, Noam, just to clarify, the agents know that the value is fixed and they are not going to get new instructions next time. Yes, the action, right, exactly. So, so that it's common knowledge essentially between uh, knowledge, everybody is that there is clear. one value for player one, one for bidder one, one value for bidder two that applies for the auctions and now let everything run. Correct? Exactly. Exactly. Okay, good. Exactly. Okay, so what kind, well, how are we going to, what, are, what agents are we going to uh, assume? So the basic idea would be, I would say, what's called fictitious play. Each one of the agent basically tries to learn according to the history, the simplest kind of learning. I look at the history of what the other agent did. Okay, now it's not going to be necessarily fixed because the agents can vary what they bid each step. I look at what the other agent bid and I'm going to do a best reply to that. So that would be the simplest kind of agent. Now it's sort of known that this simplistic, uh, this simplistic strategy is not always very good, but uh, some kind of soft version of it, a soft best reply. So I look at the previous distribution, I'm going to play more likely with higher probability uh, uh, strategies or bids that perform better relative to the history, that really works very well. And there are many types of these types of, uh, auction, of, spread, of, of uh, algorithms, if you wish. And we'll focus both on certain families of, or we'll focus both on a general regret minimizing algorithms that I'll define later on specific families in them. And to be very explicit, we'll focus on a, a very specific kind of strategy that is very, very well known and used and it's known to be regret minimizing. This is called the multiplicative weights update rule where each agent starts with a uniform distribution over all the bids. We're going to assume integer bids, so nothing is going to be continuous here. And basically, after every step, we're going to increase the, uh, the, the weight of every action that worked well, more than we're going to increase the, every, the, the weight of actions that did not work so well according to this kind of formula. So we're going to add basically a little weight times the utility that you got in the last section. And that gives you weights that vary with time. And basically each step you're simply not completely best replying, but play, basically playing a probabilist with probabilities proportional to the weight. This is called multiplicative weight. We're very well known. And we're going to just to make sure that we have a one single very simple fixed uh, uh, rule. Uh, this is what we're going to start looking at. Okay, this is all clear. Uh, okay, so as I said, multiplicative weight is one of a family of uh, algorithms, learning algorithms, if you wish, called uh, regret, regret minimizing, uh, where I have here like the general idea. So if I'm going to look at UIT to be the, the utility of bid I or action in general I at time T, I'm going to have basically capital UIT, which is the sum of utilities that I got over the whole capital T steps uh, normalized by the factor of T, okay? And I'm going to always compare the sum of the utilities of some fixed agent, some fixed action I, so someone that always play some stupid, if you wish, algorithm that always pay, uh, pay, plays a fixed action I, but this algorithm knows the, 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 the future, all the future to begin with and what the algorithm gives. And the general definition of regret minimizing uh, algorithms is the one that if I compare what my algorithm does to what the fixed other action does, 
I'm not going to lose, I'm, I'm, I'm only losing little o of one. So my loss is going to go to zero as t increases. And that's the definition. And it's known that multiplicative weight uh, has this property and there are many other algorithms with this property. And in general, these are like the, I would go most standard kind of learning, learning agents uh, that you can want to start with. Okay, so uh, there's lots of previous work. So of course, lots of work on learning and dynamics and we are going to consider dynamics and learning in games. Uh, lots and lots of work on regret minimization algorithms and analysis. Uh, of course, the practical work on auto bidders is, is very practical and the companies have paid a, little, a lot of attention to it. Uh, there have been a few works that also specifically look at regret minimizing in auctions. What happens when you take regret minimizers in auction? Not necessarily in our setting of the regret minimizing being the bidders, sometimes of an auctioneer selling to them, sometimes one-sided, various variants. Uh, there is one work that is very similar to ours in the setting, and this is uh, Feng et al. Uh, from two years ago. Uh, but the basic difference is that they considered regret minimizers that start by learning very well uh, the distribution of the other, and then they continue with stuff, which really changes uh, what happens. So I'm not going to, uh, beyond the fact that they ask basically the same kind of question, but in a completely different setting that changes the result, I'm not going to talk more about it. Okay, so let me, uh, before I continue about the analysis, I just want to be uh, very specific about what am I going to count here when I talk about what is the utility of, the, of our user when his agent runs many, kinds of, uh, many times an auction for an SBF. I just want to give you, uh, to, to, to look at what happens if you look at the st standard matching pennies. Suppose that our agents now just played matching pennies with each other, what would happen? So if you look at the graph on the right, this is the dynamics that you actually observe. And uh, so the, the orange is the first player, the probability that he plays the heads, and the blue is the probability the second player plays heads. And what's really uh, obvious here is that there is no convergence. So we have dynamics of the agents, and the dynamics do not converge to anything. They, the probability that each one of them plays head goes ups and down and does not converge. But that is not a, a real problem because if we're looking at the utilities of our users in the long run, we don't care so much about whether this converges or not, but we only care about what is the empirical distribution. So I look at all the, play, all the, all the top bid, pairs of bids throughout the auction and I just look at the distribution there because all their utilities, all their payments, all their winning probabilities are completely determined by the distribution, the actual distribution of the pairs of bits. So in the bottom right corner, I have an actual empirical distribution of the heads tails for, uh, that you get from the, from the dynamics above. And you see that here, you do get an empirical distribution on the four possible uh, pairs of hat, head, head, tail, tail, head, tail, and tail, head. Each one of them very approximately a quarter. As you can expect, and this is known also. So not only is it very well known that the dynamics do not converge, it is very well known that the empirical distribution do converge to the correct equilibrium, which is the quarter everywhere. Okay. So from now on, I'm always talking about when I talk about in this example, in this example, which is two by two. So don't yes, don't yes, make yes. people it's think that this is a general phenomenon. Careful. This is not a general phenomenon. Definitely, it's not always. Nothing always converges, even in the empirical. In two sense. by two, in two by two games, yes. But right. once you go out of that, the answer is it even usually in zero sum games. In, so there are classes of games where it's known in two by two. Two by two in zero sum games, yeah. okay, but in general, even that is not known. In fact, there are examples known where this is, does not happen. Okay, but I'm just going to say that uh, uh, whenever I talk about what happens in an auction, I'm never talking about convergence in the strict sense, but I'm also only talking about what the empirical distribution converges to. Okay, good. So let's start with a very simple example and, and to see where we are. Um, so we're, let's look at our second price auction. I have one item, two bidders, second price rule. So the high bidder wins and pays the second highest price. And what will happen? So it seems completely obvious that since the second price auction has dominant strategies, one would certainly assume that my agent will figure out what the dominant strategy is. 
And for me, once I tell him that it's, very, it's worth seven to me, for me, uh, one would hope that my agent is smart enough to figure out the dominant strategy. And then he will always pay the dominant strategy. And what will happen in a sequence of auctions is what you would expect to happen in the second price auction. Okay, so this is what one would ex uh, what would expect. And uh, let's but let's put the specific questions. Is it true? So in the second price auction, the highest value player always wins. Will this happen also when we let our agents do the bidding for us? Uh, it's true that the, the, the winner always pays the second highest value. Will this be true when the bid, agents do the bidding for us? And is it going to be incentive compatible to bid the true value? So now we have a user entering a number to his agent. Is there any reason for me not to enter my true value to my agent? Because you know the agent is trying to optimize for me. Why would I want to cheat it? And definitely in a second price auction where everything is dominant strategy, one would definitely assume that that's what you want to do. And so Nose, can I can I ask one more question even before? So yes. following up on uh, Sergio's comment before, this is not not anymore a two by two players a game. It's a two by M or whatever right. the the. Mm -hmm. So is there a convergence at all? I so far I didn't say anything about convergence. Okay. Yeah. So so you might you might think that you know this is not well defined maybe if i run it for a thousand times you will have one thing and 10000 times a different thing that's completely possible for now okay good okay so let's first of all run it okay so this I would is even say probably probable. Have simulation. i would say probable to possible Sorry? i would even say probable not just possible okay you know it's not probable. okay but uh, it's not probable and in fact as you can see uh, well, you can see. So the, now there's a question: How much do you believe our simulation? So we have simulations and also theoretical results. And uh, okay, so here's what happened when we actually ran such a simulation. So we have two players: one with value one, one with value 0 0.5, and we let them run with multiplicative weights, simple multiplicative weights algorithm, uh, where we had a simple grid uh, of of, uh, of values between zero and one. Uh, and, and of course, we never let uh, an agent never bid above the maximum value that it gave because that, that makes sense. Okay, so that's what we have here. And what do we see? So at the very beginning, if you look at the very left part of the graph, you see there's some overlap between the blue and the orange uh, values because you know the agents were learning what's going on. But after a while, the blue player always bids above the blue player is the player with value one, always bids above the orange player who bids with value one half. So, you know, you can see that mostly the high player wins, but you can see that there is no convergence because the blue player keeps on, you know, going between 0 0.5 and one approximately, and the orange player goes between zero and 0 0.5. Uh, so uh, there's no convergence whatsoever. Um, so that's what we actually see. And, and if you look at the, okay, so that's basically what you see. So the uh, stronger line in the middle of the blue and the middle of orange is a running average that we uh, just uh, put there. So you can see, you know, approximately where things are happening. So you can sort of see that, you know, the running average is pretty constant, but no proof here. Okay, so this is what happens. So let's to understand, so what does this mean? So this is not a trivial thing. Let's look at really what's important. This is the empirical distribution that we have. So the orange is the empirical distribution of the second player, of the low player, and the blue is the empirical distribution of the high player. And we should have in principle given like the distribution on pairs. And here I'm just giving the two marginal distributions because it turns out not to matter that much because it's always that the blue guy is bigger than the orange guy. So it really doesn't matter how they fit together. So this graph, this, this, this shows you. So what do we see here? So the first thing that we see is that the distribution of the blue guy is completely above the distribution of the orange guy, except for you know, a tiny little sliver there for the beginning. Uh, so the high player always wins. That's nice. The average bid of the orange guy, which is basically what the blue guy win, it pays, is only 0 0.27. So the winner does not pay the second price, it pays uh, something that's significantly lower than the second price, slightly above half of the second price. Okay, so we see that what happens here is not at all a, a second price auction. The 
the winner pays significantly less than the second price. This is what happened in simulation. Okay. So uh, can we understand what's going on here? Okay, so, so the empirical, you know, what happens here. So in a second, we'll also talk a little bit more about the significance that 0 0.27 is less than one, is in a half. But uh, for now, let me uh, just talk about the kind of analysis that we have. So here's a theorem that can, you can say. You look at the limit empirical distribution of two multiplicative weight agents playing a second price auction with values V and U. The claim is that this is what will happen. It's a, and this is the convergence of the empirical, not a convergence of the strategies itself. The high bidder will be uniform between U and V, between the low and the high value. The low bidder is not going to be uniform, uh, but it's going to have full support. And the density is going to increase monotonically as you get closer to your true value. Okay. And just to be completely sure, uh, the agents are limited to uh, here, let's say integer bids, uh, U and V consider them as large integer numbers, and I'm only looking at integer bids. This is instead of having just a, an arbitrary grid, which is equivalent. And I'm, oh, every agent here starts is only bit limited to bidding between zero and its true value. Okay, so this is a general theorem. Okay, so let's see why this happens. It's not this that uh, difficult, even as though at the beginning, it's a little bit mysterious. So Enon, another question. Is it without loss of generality that they are restricted to, to not overbid? Um, we haven't done that. I think it doesn't change much. I, I don't think it matters, but I can't say that for sure. Yeah, I, I think it doesn't matter, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I also think it doesn't matter, but I, I'm, you know, we haven't completely verified it. Mm -hmm. But you sort of need some mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, in order to make for, you need some kind of, you know, a maximum possible value because otherwise things are sort of not well defined. So, but I, I don't really think that matters. Okay. Uh, Noam, Noam, the, yes. the one shot game is dominant solvable, correct? Because you have a dominant the, strategy. The one shot game, yeah, there's a dominant strategy. So, so, the dominant so strategy, dynamics for such games, I think they are. There, there are results, I think, very old. I remember something Milgram and Roberts or something on dominant solvable games. So uh, for such games, things behave nicely. Uh, well, so I'm not... so as, you see, as you can see here, it doesn't behave nicely at all. And this is not only dominant solvable, it's dominant that each one of the two players has a dominant strategy to begin with, right? It's even much, uh, much I mean, more solvable. You, you don't call this solvable. nicely? You don't call this nice? I think this is called nice relative to what you get for general no. games. Okay, so this is not nice because, so I'm not worried so much about the convergence, although you do get one that here. I call it not nice because you would expect that a second price auction would give a second price, and this is not at all what happens. That's why I think that this is not nice. Okay, and we'll see the implications of this in a second. But let me just say, why do you get this kind of picture? So let's start looking at the low player. The low player can bid anything between his, his value and zero. Now, because his value is a dominant strategy, uh, whenever is, you get a weight update, whatever happens, whatever the high player does, the bidding a larger, a larger bid within this range is better than bidding a lower range. So in some, most cases, it's exactly the same, but if the high bidder for some strange reason bid exactly in the middle, you're actually going to lose by the lower one rather than the higher. So if you look at this point of view, then you can see that the weights of higher bids only increase relative to the weights of lower, lower bids. And in particular, if you look at the dominant strategy bidding exactly the low bid U, uh, its probability is never going to be less than one over u plus one because its weight only increases as the dynamics continue. So that's the first point of view, okay? So the first, and actually you can see from this, just from this, that the, at the end of the distribution, it's going to be monotone because as we progress, higher bids always get a higher probability relative to lower bids. So that gives you the monotonicity of the distribution of the low bidder already. But what I really want to focus here on the fact that the highest bid here, the U, uh, gets a probability of at least one over U plus one. 
So now let us focus, suppose that that's the case, what happens for the high player? Well, the low player is never going to bid above his true value. So all the bids between the low value, that the low player's value and the high player's value give you the same utility. So their probabilities will always remain the same. What we really need to worry about is what happens, uh, what's the difference in weight between the good high bids, something between U and V, and any low bids that are below the second player's value. The point is that because the low player with a constant probability, constant now only depending on the number of uh, strategies rather than the amount of time we run, always has a constant probability of playing U, the, any high bid, any non-high bid, any low bid, any bid below U uh, will keep on getting a lower, uh, will keep on, its weight will keep on decreasing uh, as we go on and decreasing exponentially fast, basically once every at least one over u plus one stages, it's going to lose a constant fact factor according to the eta, the, the, the update parameter in its weight. So uh, this is an exponential decrease. And because now we have something, the probability that you're playing less than u, less than u, it decreases exponentially. Uh, this is converges now in the sense of, uh, you know, of analysis. So you're going to only have a constant number of times that the high player bids below the low player's value. Okay. Now, because the high player only bids a constant number of times below the low player's value, the low player, the, the low player is never going to be able to completely distinguish between his possible bids because there are only a constant number, a finite number of times that any change in weight is happening there. So you're never going to get to zero uh, probability on any one of these uh, low bits. And that gives you a full support in all the low bits. Okay. So that's basically what happens. It's uh, maybe surprising at the beginning, but once you look at it, the dynamics, uh, this is what happens. Where the crucial thing is that because we have an exponential rate of decrease uh, of, of, of the high player playing low bids, uh, the low player does not have enough time to really, you know, learn. I mean, it doesn't need to learn anything better than that. Okay, so that's basically an explanation of what's going on. Okay, so now let's I'll continue. And by the way, so, so I gave a simulation with multiplicative weight. We also did simulations with other kind of uh, a regret minimizing algorithm. It basically looks very similar, not always the exact same numbers, uh, but the basic idea is that the low player uh, ends up often bidding not his high value, not his dominant strategy, but significantly less than that. Okay. No, in, in, no, in some sense, you know, this uh, dominant strategy is a bit of a cheat, right? Because there is indifference. And yes. because of indifference, right, you don't really differentiate between different bits that gives you zero utility. Yes, absolutely. So in fact, I mean, it sort of is true, at least uh, intuitively, that you know, you're going to get into some kind of uh, uh, equilibrium of the game where you know, and the dominant strategies of the two players are an equilibrium, uh, but that's not the only equilibrium. So in the second price auction, you have many different types of equilibria. And, uh, you, and what we see that here, we do not get the equilibrium that we sort of think about intuitively as the dominant strategies, but rather a different one where the low player bid significantly lower than that. So that's completely true. And that's exactly the point here. Uh, no, if, if you bias a little towards truth telling, do you get something different? Well, well yeah, I mean, if you bias the low player towards truth telling, which of course costs him nothing because he's always going to lose. So he's just, you know, hurting the other player. Then if you bias him enough, then he will definitely go towards truth telling. And the, the first player will not, and the high player will pay the second price. That's obviously the case. Yeah, or, or alternatively, you can think about, you know, each one of the agents not showing up with tiny probability. Maybe that would be sufficient, right? Um, if the high player is not showing up with like tiny probabilities, then. Uh... Um, well, no, if it's not just not showing up, then it's not good. But if the high player, let's say, with a tiny probability is, uh, is bidding very low values, that yeah. should be enough to push the, random or something the like right that. direction, yes. 
Uh, there might be an advantage to using up uh, uh, the budget of the high bidder if there was a budget. So that would force people, that would force a low bidder to occasionally um, go high. Okay. That's true. So if you if you actually give him some kind of extra utility by one of many ways, maybe because the high bidder sometimes accidentally bids low, maybe because uh, you just you give him some kind of benefit from reduce from taking away the budget of the high bidder and so on, then he will learn to bid high just to hurt the high, high guy. But in the simplest kind of simulation, that does not happen. Okay, good. Okay, so now let's see. A, but but then what? really is, uh, let's try to understand, what is the meaning of the fact that the average payment, the average bid of the low bidder is 0 0.27? What is the, what is, and, and it's always going to be, so we proved that it's going to be significantly less than one half because the support is full. So what does it mean that the average bid of the low player, that the average payment is significantly less than the second price? I claim that this already, already makes the meta auction not incentive compatible. So there is a very easy way for the bidders to cheat in this auction. And here is what happens. Suppose now that the true values of the bidders were not one and 0 0.5, not Alice one and Bob 0 0.5, but suppose that Alice true value was 0 0.4 and Bob was 0 0.5. If both of them reported the true values to their agents, then uh, Alice would always lose and Bob would win for some price that's low, strictly less than 0 0.4. Okay, so if Alice reports the truth to her own agent, she gets utility zero. But what happens if Alice uh, now reports to her agent the value one? So now her agent will try to optimize as though Alice's value was one, which is not the case. What would happen there? In that case, we would get exactly the previous dynamics. So Alice would win always, and her payment would be 0 0.27, which is the average payment in the previous one. So that means that if Alice bids zip one rather than the true 0 0.4, she would now get a positive utility, okay? So this basically shows that the second price auction, when you run it through agents in a meta auction is not incentive compatible. And by the way, all the examples that you gave previously, it's, if the agents learn previously, then also this does not happen. You do get incentive compatibility and so on. Okay, so that, that shows, if you wish, the problem looking at the first, at the second price option. And Noam, Noam, question. This point twenty seven. how robust is it with the algorithm? I mean, the multiplicative weights. Sorry? If you do something else, you still get zero. Yeah, so, so we showed two, two other simulations of two other regret minimizing algorithms. One of them is a hedge, other perturbed follows the leader, and you get a similar result there. So the dynamics look different, but the basic, uh, the, the, the basic uh, structure- But it's significantly less than, than one half. That's, a, that's what matters. Yes, right? yeah, so here are the two graphs. So here are these two graphs. The payment is still significantly less than one half. And with these two, Maybe there are other, uh, you know, there are many more regret minimizing algorithms we haven't tried all of. Okay, so uh, we can actually look what is it. So now we can sort of try to analyze the meta game. So what is the equilibrium of the meta game? What is the best reply of Alice and so on? So uh, this graph looks at the best reply of Alice. Look at only at the green player. Uh, so the best reply of the utility that Alice gets by giving various kinds of uh, a various kinds of bids uh, when the Bob has value 0 0.5 and declares 0 0.5, okay? So basically, if she bids less than 0 0.5, she will always lose, so her utility will be zero. If she bids a little more than 0 0.5, she will start winning, but then she will play a pay a value, a uh, price that is very close to 0 0.5, it turns out. Only when she really exaggerates her bid, uh, her value, to let's say something like below 0 0.6, she starts getting positive utility, which keeps on going up the more she, she exaggerates. So it goes on beyond one even, even if her, she bid two, she would make even a little more money. And as it goes to infinity, 
uh, basically she will pay exactly half of the other player's price, never less than half, because you always get the, at least the uniform distribution. And uh, so that's basically the, the best, you know, the possible best replies that Alice has. So if we look at this, we can sort of analyze what are the equilibrium and the equilibrium in this kind of meta auction is one player's bid as high as possible, let's say infinity or the maximum allowed bid. And the other player doesn't really matter as long as it's not too high to make the first player uh, pay more than his true value. And that's a very wide uh, class of equilibria of the meta game, uh, many of them going in the, up, in the wrong direction. Okay, so now let's get to second, first price auction. Oh man, time not here. Really okay. So now what happens when we run a first price auction where each player bids and, but the winner pays his value and we ask the same questions. Uh, will the high player always win? Will he pay this? What, what is the average price? How much is he going to pay? Uh, and, the, and is it incentive compatible in the sense that each one of the players wants to, should he wants to give the true value to his agent. So again, let's start by running, uh, running simulations. So we have here two simulations. On the left hand is a simulation where one of the players has value one, the blue player, and the, one, the second player has value 0 0.5. And as you can see, after a short while at the beginning where the sort of things are mixed, messed up, uh, the blue player, player figures out he really wants to bid 0 0.5, and this is what he's going to pay, basically, while the yellow player keeps on oscillating, and, uh, but the oscillation is such that the, you know, the empirical distribution is high enough, so the blue player is not going to gain by going below 0 0.5. So we see a nice, uh, uh, now I say this is nice, we see a nice sort of convergence, semi-convergence to what we would want to happen, the high player winning, paying the second highest price, the equilibrium if you wish. Uh, Norm, this, sorry, Norm, question, yes. just, uh, it applies to everything. The, the parameter of the multiplicative weights, I think you called it eta, if I remember correctly, right. That is a function of capital T if you want things to behave nicely. Indeed. So when you do the simulations, uh, you for each capital T you are running a different algorithm. What are you doing exactly? Yes, yes. So okay, so there are okay, so so this is a delicate thing. So there are two two I ways. Know, I know. It's probably not for the not for the for the general audience. No, so the general, for, uh, no, okay, so, so no, let me say. So the, this whole regret so there are two ways to uh, to formalize regret minimization as T goes to infinity. The first one, which is the one usually used, you have, if you wish, a fixed horizon capital T. And for each capital T, you have your own algorithm with its own eta. And then you look what happens when T goes to infinity. So we have a sequence of algorithms. This is the formalism we have here. The second formalism is sort of more natural in this setting, but it's more problematic technically. Some other papers used it, but we did not. And the second pair considers a single algorithm for an infinite horizon where eta goes down as a, with variable eta. Okay, so that's a second formalism. You can also do things that way. It's a little more complicated technically. So we have not, we are not doing it. We are looking at fixed horizon algorithms where the horizon is a thing that goes to infinity. Now, you know what my next question will be? Yes, I, we already know it. Yes, no, I why don't, don't you know. use algorithms? for which you don't care what the yeah, horizon okay, is. Yeah. And the algorithm is just as simple and, uh, and you don't have to adapt anything. Yes, what I know, there? but that's not a question, but rather a statement, so. <laughs> I don't mean a statement, it's a theorem. I'm, I'm stating a theorem that there are such algorithms. I okay, can tell you what Still, it's not the question, Sergio. Huh? It's still not the question. <laughs> okay, so let me continue. Let, let's look at the right hand side. The right hand side looks at, okay, so at the left hand side, we see where there is a significant difference between the values of the two players. Pretty quickly, they find the equilibrium. The right hand side, what happens where the two players have very similar values? For example, in the extreme case, values one. And you see two graphs. The higher graph is basically when the time goes from zero to 5,000, where things go up and they sort of reach an equilibrium, but very slowly. So you see after 5,000 steps, they only got to something like 0 0.85. 
And in the low, uh, you know, the inner graph is we ran it for much longer, for a million steps. And that's like a logarithmic time scale is the, the bottom. And it keeps on going up and it keeps on basically uh, converging if you wish. And here you really actually do get some kind of convergence, but you can see how low, slow this goes. Even though it's a logarithmic scale, it goes up very slowly. Okay. So we sort of feel by these pictures that things do uh, converge to the right thing when the right thing is the high player wins, wins and pays the second highest price. But let's see if we can analyze this. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Sorry, that I, uh, my, my, uh, the graph that we are seeing is, yes. say, the left graph is let's run the algorithm for t equals 10,000 and that's a picture or you tell me the picture of the algorithms for all values of t between one and 10,000. No, no, no. What do this I see is there? A single, this is a single, a single run. run. Single run. This is like a typical run, a single run of a single algorithm. Of a single algorithm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So let, let's see if we can, uh, how are we going to analyze what is going to happen? Now we want to basically try to get some kind of theoretical analysis of what happens here. And basically, we would like to say, can we talk about what is the equilibrium of this dynamics? So uh, there is something that is well known. The empirical distribution sort of converges to a coarse, equi to a coarse equilibrium, to a coarse correlated equilibrium. Now, what do I mean sort of converges? There is a whole polytope of coarse correlated equilibrium, and it is known that it gets arbitrarily close to this polytope. It need not it converged to a single point within this polytope. And now what is this polytope? Where does this polytope live? This polytope is a polytope of probability distributions, joint distribution, probability distribution over the pair of bits. Okay? So this is the world we're talking to. And there is some kind of this show no this uh, weak notion of convergence there. So it gets close to being a coarse correlated equilibrium, but we don't know which one of them, and we don't know that it actually converges to a specific one. Okay. And what is a coarse correlated equilibrium? So uh, for some people who don't, well, I think I do have to, to mention it because there isn't. So basically, we have a distribution about the joint bids, the joint probabilities of bids. So Pij is going to be a probability that the first player bids i, the second player bids j. Okay, and it's called the coarse correlated equilibrium if the utility that the first player gets from this distribution, which is what you see on the left hand side of the equality, is not less than what he would get if instead of playing the distribution on his values i, he would pay a fixed i star for any i star. Okay, so that would be a coarse, a coarse, uh, coarse correlated equilibrium. Basically, if you wish, it's a formalization of the no regret property if we take it all the way to the distribution uh, that you get. Okay, and dually for the second player. So this is what is known. So is that going to help us uh, basically analyze what happens when the two players play, the two agents play a first price auction? They are intuitively going to get into some kind of equilibrium. And if we understand this equilibrium, and now we know that they are going to get to a coarse correlated equilibrium, then we know what is going to be the empirical distribution in the long run? Okay, so do we know what the equilibrium of uh, what's the equilibria of a, what a course what's the equilibria of the of the full information full price auction? So remember, from the point of agent, we have now a single auction fixed v fixed u, and now the agents are basically playing this fixed first price auction with these fixed values many times. Or what is the equilibrium of this first full information? Uh, game. Okay, so if we look at what is the pure equilibrium, well, the high player wins and pays the second highest price. If you look, what are the mixed Nash equilibria of this game? The same thing. If you look at the correlated equilibria of what is this game? The same thing. But we don't know that you're going to get to a pure equilibria, mixed equilibria, or correlated equilibria. We only know that we're going to get to the most general <clears throat> kind of equilibrium, which is a coarse correlated equilibrium. And the question is, what are the what happens there? What happens with a coarse correlated equilibrium? Do, can we analyze what is the outcome? And of course, each one of the pure equilibria, mixed equilibria, correlated equilibria are also a coarse correlated equilibria. So the correct out answer basically is a coarse correlated equilibrium, but maybe there are other equilibria uh, that will make it, make it difficult for us to know what is the out, 
outcome. <clears throat> and it turns out that indeed uh, it's very sad, but if you look what are the course correlated equilibria of the full information first price auction, there are many of them and they're pretty nasty. So some of them is the low value player can win. And even if the high value player wins, uh, he can pay significantly less than the second price. So things are nasty. And in, in my work with Brendan and Michal, we actually uh, characterize how bad can it be and not arbitrarily bad, but you know, pretty bad, but definitely worse than uh, the correct answer. <clears throat> so here's a so very- Norm, This suggests, Norm, this suggests Take, take your dynamic and instead of applying it to regrets, apply it to internal regrets or conditional regrets, then you're going to get to the set of correlated equilibria, which are nice. Now, in principle, it's the same thing. If, so you only, what, have to keep, you only have to keep track, not of just one regret, but you have to keep track of uh, the number of possible beads right. uh, regrets. And, so what and you're then you get what say. Sergio, what you're saying is that if I, if I, if I take and, and make sure that my, uh, my, my algorithm is not just a regret minimizer, but uh, but what's called an internal regret minimizer, exactly. then it will get to a correlated equilibrium and we will get to the right- To the set of correlated equilibria again, to the set. Right. But I'm not asking that, I'm asking what happens to the, an, an arbitrary regret or certain kind of uh, or, or multiplicative weights and so on, okay? And no, here no, we I have know. an example- no, I'm saying it's not, conceptually, it's not much more complicated, but agree, in terms of result, you get something much better in I this agree, case. I That's agree all. that in this, well, I mean, maybe we can get even for general regret minimizing algorithm of multiplicative weights is the correct result anyway. And this is where we're going to. Okay. Uh, okay, oh. good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, Okay, so here's, for example, if you look at the following distribution where uh, among two players with value one, where the distribution is uniform on the pairs of bids zero, both of them playing bidding zero, both of them 0 0.46, both of them 64, 0 0.64, and both of them 0 0.73. You can actually verify that's a course correlated equilibrium. And the average price, the average payment is less than one half even, which is significantly less than one. Okay, so there are course equilibria which are bad. And uh, in fact, you may reach regret minimizing algorithms may reach an arbitrary course equilibria, course equilibrium. So it's what's known that our regret minimizing algorithms uh, can reach any course equilibrium that you have. And in fact, if you have more than a single course equilibrium, they cannot reach anything, but rather completely oscillate between let's say two course equilibria or even more. Okay. Uh, this is true also for this specific first price auction? Um, yes. So this is completely uh, universal. In any game, including this first price auction, for any course equilibrium of, this for, of the first price auction, you can find regret minimizing algorithms that get them. Okay. So this basic result is, is due to Mono and Pylorus, I think. And uh, we also show the same kind of argument, basically you can extend it and show that you need not get to any single one of them. Either. But are there, I mean, this is exist a regret, are there regret exist minimizing? Regret minimizing? So let me get, just give you the, the, the very simple proof because it will be easier to give the proof than that. So the basic idea is uh, find, you know, there is a course correlated equilibrium, find an arbitrary sequence of pairs of bids that converge to that, you can always do that. So if both players do that, so, and, and let's both players do that. Now this is not completely, so if both of them do the right thing, they're regret minimizing according to them, which is fine because we chose the course equilibrium, course correlated equilibrium, which exactly ensures that. But we also, to be a real regret minimizing algorithm, you also need to make sure that if the other players does anything, you regret minimizing, in which case, Whenever the other player does something that you, you that was not part of the agreed upon sequence, you just would do re revert and do a normal regret minimizing algorithm. So these two regret minimizing algorithms will just uh, converge to the correct thing. Okay. So what's the definition why... of a regret minimizing algorithm? Sorry. What's what's the class of regret minimizing algorithms? What's the class? Oh, uh, what's the definition of a regret? What, a regret what minimizing algorithm is that for anything that the adversary does, even the strongest definition, anything that the adversary does, your regret goes to zero with high probability according only about your coin, coin tosses. 
Okay, so it's any definition that you want. It's a very strong. It's not any trick that I'm doing a weird regret minimizing algorithm. It's completely a regret minimizing algorithm in the strongest sense that you can think of. Okay, so we're not going to be just able using the fact that it's a regret minimizing agent. We're not going to be able to show that you get to the correct outcome because there are incorrect outcomes that regret minimizing algorithms can lead to. Okay, so, uh, but we do show that uh, in fact, you are, our regret minimizing algorithm or a family of regret minimizing algorithms is not going to get to any bad uh, outcome, but rather to a refinement of a course correlate equilibrium, which we call the co-undominated. And the, the point is, What's a co-undominated equilibrium? I look, I'm looking at the supports of the two players, actions that they can uh, play with non-zero probability. And I want them not to play anything that is dominated by another, uh, by another strategy, where domination is only relative to the support of the other player. So that's the definition. And once we have this definition, we're going to have two lemmas. The first lemma will show that the dynamics of something will converge in a certain sense to a co-undominated CCE, so not to an arbitrary course correlated equilibrium, but rather to a nice one. And the second uh, theorem, that, theorem lemma that we'll have is that these refined class of course correlated equilibria are good. You only get the high, high player winning and paying the second highest price. Okay. So let me maybe to, to, to show why is the example that I had before not co-undominated. So the distribution that they previously had, I'm look, I'm writing, I wrote in this table the probabilities of the, all the joint distributions. So with probability 0 0.5, both players play zero. There is probability 0 0.5, both players play 46 and so on. Why is this not co-undominated? Because look at the first row where the first player plays zero with probability one quarter. That is a dominated strategy. Why is that? Because it's better for him to play one. Why is it better for him always to play one? Well, if the other player, if the column player pays, plays 46 or 64 or 73, he loses, the, loses in both cases, so he gets equality. But if the first player plays zero, then instead of tying at zero and winning with probability one half, now we completely win because he's playing one and paying maybe a little bit more, paying one rather than zero. But that of course is much less than his gain from winning with probability one rather than one half. So this- so Norm, is, Norm, such a, such a CCE must be a, a mixture of Nash equilibria. No, it must not. Because it's, uh, it they, are, they are, they uh, are, uh, uh, I don't think that is correct. If you take it's it's so zero, it, it can only be as a, a CCE if zero zero is an equilibrium, forty six forty six is an equilibrium, and so on. No, I don't think so. No, no, no? no not at okay. all. Not at no. all. Okay, just, okay, I'm not. Yes. I think it's a pretty weak requirement. Okay. I, yeah, I think Noam that this is exactly what we show in our previous paper that it's not. That it's. But the answer to Sergio's question is negative. no. Okay. Uh, that, that's okay. true. Cool. Yeah, we have counterexamples in our previous paper. You're right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. No, no. I I take it. I mean. Okay. Good. So here's the real lemma one, um, and I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but I probably won't prove it. Uh, okay. So first of all, we we're, we're restricting ourselves to a class of regret minimizing algorithm called a. Uh, uh, called, called mean-based. So this is a nice class defined by Braverman et al. And they showed that basically most of the great minimizing algorithms that you know, including multiplicative weights, uh, perturbed follow the leader and so on, uh, are in fact in this class of nice regret minimizing algorithms. And what we show that dynamics of this nice class of regret minimizing algorithms converge to a, uh, uh, an undom a co undominated course equilibrium. Okay, so uh, and uh, so that's the, the so that's the real thing that we do. And there is another uh, delicate issue here 
uh, where, okay, so before looking, talking the other delicate issue, uh, what is the mean based algorithm? What is the properties that they have? Well, you would expect a regret minimizing algorithm. You would expect that if some kind of action consistently performs worse, if some kind of action I consistently performs worse than another action I prime, where I say consistently worse, if the average utility that it gets is smaller by a constant on the average than what you would than the other guys, then you would expect the bad action to be played with probabilities that goes to zero. Okay, so definitely most natural learning algorithms make that, but it's not necessarily the case. And this is what a, a mean-based regret minimizing algorithm is. Okay, so this is a real lemma that we have that if you take a nice, a mean-based regret minimizing algorithm, then it converges to an un, to a co-undominated course correlated equilibrium, which then has a nice property that we want. But there no, is a you know that there is one that converges at all. Okay, and so let me uh, let me uh, skip the sort of proof idea and uh, talk about the hidden open problem in the previous theorem. Oh. So, <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean to, to I didn't mean to to, ch to change your uh, talk. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So okay. we show that you it converges to a co-undominated course correlated equilibrium if it converges but we do not know that it actually converges, okay? So if it converges, it must converge to something good. And in our simulations, we see that it converges. So it's reasonable that it converges to something good, but, and, and again, I'm talking about convergence in the empirical distribution sense in the weak sense, but still we do not know how to prove that it converges. Uh, so that's an open problem. I think maybe it's not, it, so we couldn't do it, but maybe it's completely doable, I don't know. But that's definitely an interesting open problem that we sort of hid uh, in our theorem. Uh, and uh, so I think I won't prove also. So the other second proof: Why is it true that a co that a course correlated equilibrium that is co undominated has good outputs? You can analyze this with the additional property of co undominated and see that you must always have the high bit player winning and paying the second highest price. Again, I'm going to skip uh, for lack of time, the proof of the second lemma, which is uh, very simple actually. Okay, so I'm just going to flash a few slides and other things that we, uh, that we looked at. So now we could also look at what happens when you have, let's say generalized first price or second price auction. So for example, generalized first price auction. Now we have two ad slots, maybe the first one, uh, it has a click-through rate of one, so a value of one. The second one has a value that's always one half of the value of the first one. What, what happens there? And then we run lots of simulations and we see what happens and we can analyze things like what is the Nash equilibrium of that, which apparently no one did before, uh, but we cannot really analyze uh, what are the distributions that you get to, uh, but we can uh, run simulations and we ran simulations. And according to simulations, we can sort of see what sort of fits. And we have very nice expressions for the distributions that we think you get to. And these nice expressions uh, fit very well with the empirical results with our simulations, but we have no proof whatsoever that you actually reach what we think that you reach. Okay, so I don't know what kind of results you can look at that definitely not theoretical results, but semi-theoretical results. We have some kind of uh, expression, it fits the data. We don't know how to analyze it. So uh, an interesting hidden open problem here is to show that what we observed is it's true. So now how is it different than the equilibrium analysis done in the original papers, like by uh, Hal Varian and Michael Schwartz on, they, they so do analyze- is, okay. So first of all, this is the first price auction, okay? This is a uh, first price auction rather than a generalized second price auction. So if you look at the generalized second price auction, you get the same problem as in the second price auction. So basically the prices, when you run it through agents, you get prices that are significantly lower than what you'd expect, okay? So the same problem that we saw with the second price auction also work, happened for the generalized first price auction. So you don't get to the variant et al analysis, 
because the agents are playing it in a different way than humans. They're not doing the, the, the dominant strategy, okay? And in the first price, it's happened something strange. And again, what happens is, if you look at it from the point of view of the companies basically providing these agents to the users, any way that we look at it, they lose lots of money. So uh, because Google is, if Google is providing us with just normal regret minimizing algorithms, multiplicative weight algorithms, okay, which one would expect that they do, then they're going to lose a significant amount of money relative to what you would want to happen in this auction, which is the, you know, the correct uh, equilibrium Bayesian Nash or dominant strategy or whatever. Okay, so there's a mystery here. Uh, whether the companies this, are, giving, no, us, are really giving us regret minimizing algorithms, and if so, are they really losing money? In claiming that they're losing money on first price, on second price? On everything. Oh. So, no, on first price, okay, first price, if they were giving us simple first price auctions, they would not lose money. But if they're giving us second price auctions, generalized second price auctions, or generalized first price auctions, in all of these cases, they are losing money. They are if losing money. Really they are losing money in the equilibrium, or in, in the equilibrium. And what? In the, they're losing money in the equilibrium of the agent of the meta, meta game of what the agents reach relative to what we would expect to happen in the equilibrium of the original auction, which is what they should be getting. Basically, how does this work with revenue equivalence? Are you like in the, if they are like if the this right is person? Not, is oh. Uh, they're losing money uh, not in the equilibrium, but when uh, they're losing money not in the equilibrium, not in the equilibrium after the uh, users have done their strategizing, ah. but only when the users are still uh, truthful. I see. Okay. Yes. Because in, in the meta game, when they're playing like the equilibrium, yes. then they should be fine, right? In the in the, in the meta game, it's a, in a Bayesian kind of analysis that they should be able to fix for it. Yes. Okay. If if the correct person keeps on winning. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So so and then we do some kind of analysis of what happens in the meta game, really. So we really analyze what should the users do, but I won't get into it. I'll just talk about uh, some. So I think there's an enormous amount of further work to be done. First of all, the convergence that I've talked about, you know, the result, if it converges, it's fine. It's not as nice as uh, it converges and it's fine. So there's a big question there. And in general, convergence is a, is a really pain in the ass apparently in dynamics in general, but maybe in simple games like auctions, you could do something better. So especially where your agents are you know, you have control of them. So it would be nice to, to find some kind of reasonable convergence result, which may not be as difficult as general dynamics. And the second thing is we looked at multiplicative wage agent, agents or some other kind of standard agents. It would be nice to actually get agents that are on one hand optimizing for me, but on the other hand, sort of friendly to the other agents, uh, maybe getting a better, you know, social welfare for everyone. So can we design such agents, regret minimizing and friendly and leading to good results. And maybe look at it from a point of view of collusion, we're having the users here. In some sense, the agents of the users are colluding against the auctioneer and maybe you can make this a complete, uh, you know, a significant uh, issue. And of course, we analyze auctions here. I think many interesting games uh, you can analyze this way. We analyze a few, some, a few such games, the meta games for some other games in a different paper, but I think there's enormous amount of work to be done there. And then we were looking at the simplest type of auto bidders, which had no constraints across all the sequence of the auctions, but rather each one of them separately was just additive. Of course, uh, general auto bidders may have other things, they may have some targets, may have a budget and so on. And it will be really interesting to see, you know, what can you analyze about more interesting, if you wish, auto bidders. Uh, so all these are, I think, pretty huge uh, problems and that's why I think there's lots of work to be done. Thanks so thank much. you.